I am primarily a specialist of the early modern period and particularly the period of Khmelnytsky. Unlike my two predecessors, we live in a university world where more and more everything that happened before the 20th century begins to disappear. And I'm very grateful to the authors of this book that this, th these periods do not disappear in the book. Secondly, I am North American born. Uh, and uh, that is of some significance because starting in the 1960s, I was involved in various discussion groups between diaspora communities of Ukrainians and Jews in the 1960s, largely in defense of Soviet political prisoners. And that was perhaps the best period that I remember of this. Uh, and later over many other issues. I also, like one of the authors of the book, Professor Magochi, was at Harvard at the point that Omelian Pritzak, who was director of the Ukrainian Institute, and Shmuel Ettinger, one of the leading his, uh, Israeli scholars of Eastern Europe, formed a close friendship and dialogue groups. And I want you to remember that. Those were dialogues between the Ukrainian diaspora and Israel, not between the Ukrainian diaspora and the Jewish diaspora in North America, and certainly had, had nothing to do with Ukraine at that point. And we can deal with those later. But back to the topic of, of our major topic of our, our discussions today. I would first posit that there are two major narratives or paradigms in two historical periods that largely define what we might call Ukrainian and Jewish visions of Ukraine. The first will be the early modern, that is to the end of the 18th century, largely a social narrative and somewhat national. What was the Ukrainian narrative? Ukraine was the land of freedom, where the population resisted serfdom, rose up in arms under the leadership of the Cossacks, and was able to put off the imposition of slavery serfdom on much of its population for much of that period. It also led to the formation of an independent or semi-independent Ukrainian state, the Cossack Hetmanate, and to the clear flourishing of a distinct Ukrainian culture, the culture of the Ukrainian Baroque of the late 17th and early 18th century. As Jews fit in this narrative largely, they were proponents of the oppressive regime of the Polish-Lithuanian state that was trying to impose serfdom on the population. The Jewish narrative. Ukraine was the land of milk and honey. Salaboron called it the Ukrainian volcano. He called it that because he said Ukraine offered Jews ability to live in a way they had never had before, to take up all kinds of new positions, but this was a terribly dangerous thing to do, and it often led to violence, that is, uprisings from the population, and therefore death of and uh, destruction of Jewish community and of Jewish populations. That Jewish narrative largely would argue that Jews brought economic and civilizational progress to Ukraine. That's my first early modern paradigm. The second ones, modernization, emancipation, nation, and state. That is the period of the 19th and 20th century. The Ukrainian narrative, social emancipation, above all the abolition of serfdom in the 19th century, finally freed up the possibility for much of the Ukrainian population to take part in advance, both socially and culturally. The 19th century was a period of Ukrainian national awakening. There was a struggle for civic and cultural rights. And then in the 20th century, the major narrative is the formation of statehood, a Ukrainian state. Jews are frequently seen as groups opposed to the social and cultural advances of the Ukrainian population, particularly in the rural areas, and uh, often opposed as Jews assimilated to Russian, Polish, and other cultures to a Ukrainian state. Jewish narrative. Emancipation, above all, Jews receive coming late in Eastern Europe, first in the Habsburg Empire. That is, above all, civil emancipation and ability to live in a liberal, more liberal society. For parts of the Jews of that time, this is also the assumption of identities of the peoples and states in which they live. That is, as they become Frenchmen in France, they to degree become Poles and Russians and Germans in much of the territory of Ukraine. There is an active Jewish secular culture, but that this is the rise of a new kind of virulent anti-Semitism in Europe, which views become, Jews become victims to, and in a certain way, Zionism, that is the search for Jewish nationhood, is a response. The Ukrainians are a backward population in these zones, a dangerous one, and often rise up to destroy Jews and Jewish communities. Now, I bring those narratives because 
dozens, hundreds of good Jewish, Ukrainian, and historians who are neither have written and provided much additional information that undermines these paradigms, that shows that they did not always apply, that shows the dangers of generalization and stereotypes over long historical periods and trying to go from an early period to a later period. And many of them also wrote counter to what we might call their national paradigm. That is, you have people like Pantelimon Kulish, Ukrainian historian who goes absolutely against the general Kozakophilia of Ukrainian historiography, and many 19th century Jewish historians who saw the, the Jewish role in Ukraine as socially regressive and regretted this. There are dozens and hundreds of other possibilities. Now, why is this still this volume you have before you a breakthrough? And I think it's a major breakthrough. And I think it is for a number of reasons. First of all, we have two eminent scholars of this field, both of whom have devoted their studies not only to the one group, but as they can to the, to the other group as well, and to more general situations. So the, this is the great present we get from their work. But above all, I think they break down the issue of always studying Jewish-Ukrainian affairs as relations, and particularly for moments of conflict. What they present before us, above all, to the Ukrainian reader, broadly, so who is the Ukrainian reader? Those who know Ukrainian history better, they present the Jewish narrative of the Jews of Ukraine. That is, one can only read those sections and avoid all the sections on Ukraine, and even avoid the, the, the relations sections and get a perspective of what happened with Jews in Ukraine over a longer period of time. And I would hesitate to say, for those who know Jewish history, uh, in which Ukraine is only a background or, or at times a place of danger, they can, they can look at what the Ukrainian perspective is. And in that, I think they have done much. They have challenged us to engage the other fully to try and look uh, from the, the, the other's perspective and to look at the other studying oneself and the other, other dealing with the other group. And I think that's a very valuable part of this book. And above all, they provide context for those difficult moments, those hard stories, the things that we may at times for the sake of dialogue wish to avoid. Because once one provides context, uh, one can place those events and understand that, that despite their tremendous significance, they fit in what we have, lab have labeled in this book coexistence. Now, then uh, a criticism that is in a way not a criticism. My problem with the term ethnic Ukrainians, one finds in the book. That is, uh, frequently you read through and you find Jews and ethnic Ukrainians do this and Jews and ethnic Ukrainians do that. First of all, as a historian, my great fear. Can one picture what new histories of Austria-Hungary will be like if this method is uh, taken on? We will have ethnic Slovaks and ethnic Romanians and ethnic everyone in the book. Our books will become much longer. Uh, clearly through this, uh, if one follows uh, this uh, method. Uh, I understand why it was brought in, and it was brought in, I think, for a very noble purpose. Uh, it, 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 it wants to be inclusive in some way of the other groups who lived on the Ukrainian territories, and therefore wants to see possibly that the name Ukrainian can apply to all of them. But did they historically? Or are really we talking about the history of Ukrainians, whether they were called Ruthenians or whatever in an earlier period, and Jews, two peoples. Studies of ethnoses or national groups is, after all, quite respectable. Uh, Hrushevsky, who I work on quite a bit, uh, deal, dealt with this greatly. And really, is it applicable before 1917? That is, uh, 1917 is when, in many ways, Ukraine as a territory takes on borders in a, in a mean, more meaningful sense. Uh, and finally, or is it applicable before 1991? That is when one has a Ukrainian state. Did it not take that Ukrainian political entity to finally shift it? And then we also divide, and here I go on really thin ice, the problem of ethnic Jews. 38,000 people on the Canadian census declare that they are ethnic Jews, but not Jews by religion. 
Canada has adopted a different vision of who Jews are from the U.S. In the U.S., Jews are only a religion and it is unacceptable to view them in other groups. In Canada, you, there are two possibilities to answer Jews on the census, your religion and your ethnicity. And of course, Eastern Europe has long viewed, and in some ways, Ukrainian, many Ukrainians viewed Jews as a nation before Jews viewed themselves as a nation, as we well know from the Zionist movement and, and uh, the context with Ukrainians in the 19th century. And then finally, when do the categories emerge of Ukrainian Jews or Jewish Ukrainians? That is, are these terms used yet? When are they used? Can they be used? They are clearly used in North American Jewish Canadians, Canadian Jews. We know that they can be used in Poland in many ways. Will they be used in Ukraine? And what I would argue is what they are telling us is about something that largely is coming. It is, being, it, is, it is coming at our time, and in this way, the book is very useful. That is, I am willing to put up with too many of those ethnics, maybe if, it, if the point can be made, uh, although I question it. And then finally, when we can see uh, where this really will come about. Uh, we have a project on the Holodomor, also funded by the Temerte Foundation, the same group that funds, uh, funds the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. And we have, over the past 30, 35 years, done a tremendous amount of new research on the Holodomor. We know much more than we could. One couldn't do it as long as the Soviet Union existed. We now, we may debate numbers of how many people died, but we can say that good demographers come up with four to five million. Some people view it as somewhat more. We know how many people died. We know much more about how and when they died in Ukraine. Uh, of those four to five million, uh, the overwhelming majority die in three months of 1933 when all foodstuffs were seized in Ukraine, which made Ukraine diverge from much of the Soviet famine. We also know that Stalin at the end of 1932 decided that the Ukrainian Communist Party was getting too uppity. Uh, that Ukraine was showing signs of independent existence. And while there were famines in Russia, it appears quite high, highly likely that Stalin decided to have all the foodstuffs seized in Ukraine to in some ways bring Ukraine to its knees. He was bringing Ukraine to its knees, but that meant he was bringing all the population of Ukraine in rural areas to its knees. That is, this special treatment of Ukraine came because Ukraine was Ukraine. It was above all aimed at Ukrainians in the way he was seeing the political sense, and many of the members of the Ukrainian government were of Jewish background as well, and they were all to be brought to their knees, and Ukrainians and Jews, the two groups we stalk, or the ethnic Ukrainians and ethnic Jews, die in that famine. Uh, the, we now know much more about how people die and when they die. We are beginning to even know about groups uh, down to the point of, say, Mennonites, who are a great, a uh, great segment of the population. And indeed, we find that they ha the groups have had different trajectories. It was not all the same. The Mennonite committees in the West got aid through, bribed, bribed Soviet authorities, and Mennonites were saved during the famine because of the organization of, of Mennonite groups in the West, we now know. Uh, and we may know more as we study this. But it is also, therefore, I think, the beginning of what we can see happening since the Maidan. The Maidan has changed uh, the entire, I think, uh, civic national makeup of Ukraine. The Ukraine has become, in many ways, a civic nation. The Jews of Ukraine have variously reacted to it. Some Jews died on the Maidan fighting for the new Ukraine and other Jews still see themselves as, as Russian Jews or are willing to listen to Putin. Fortunately, they are less willing to listen to Putin than many people in North York are. I think in certain ways, the diaspora groups tend to be, as usual, retrograde in their views, and we find much more debates, I think, going on in North York about what, whether Ukraine should be a state or not than we do among Jews in Ukraine. But for Ukraine itself, uh, that offers this new opportunity. And so while the ethnic Ukrainians may not fit, I think, for all the historical periods, particularly before the 20th century, uh, we have great hopes it's going to fit for the future. Thank you.